Hello and welcome. In this YouTube, I was in the area of Kent with a group of fishermen that are a member of a club named Puget Sound Anglers. And you know what was a little disappointed to me? There was hardly anybody there. And we had a doctor in fisheries from the state of Washington sharing with us what they're doing to try and improve the fishing in Puget Sound for the sport as well as commercial. And they're working to identify the runs as they migrate up into different river systems around oh our God, state. Mount online, Baker was the subject today. of topic um, here in this particular one. But we also so covered we'll Jefferson Head. Um, and this individual have, with the state did her best to share with um, us what they're doing to help improve the fish that swim in the waters uh, of our Check this out. Cool that um, I'm going to touch briefly on a project that we're doing with the, the commercial chum fishery out in the marine area um, off of uh, Alaco Point off of Kingston for anybody who's familiar, familiar with that area, which I feel like this group should be very familiar with that area. Um, and then finally, we have a new project that we're starting up this year in Lake Washington that I'll touch on briefly as well at the end. Um, as I said, we are going to do a quick look ahead, uh, kind of some things that we're expecting for this year that I know that this group is very interested on, um, and then some upcoming meetings where you will have a chance to hear a lot more about upcoming seasons. Um, before I really get going, though, I do need to acknowledge a bunch of folks that are, um, have been really integral to all this work getting done. Uh, particularly my, uh, my hydroacoustic monitoring team within the department, Dr. Mickey Aga, um, Alex Sawyer, who is new to the, our group, and we're so excited to have her. Uh, a lot of the Skagit work that you're going to see presented here tonight was work that she's been doing um, since about May of last year, so really appreciate everything that she's been doing, uh, so I can't go through this without acknowledging all of her hard work. Uh, Patia Day, who is one of our commercial team members, has been integral in getting all these projects up and running as well. Uh, my fish management team for on the, the recreational side of things, and then uh, Region 4, who's been instrumental in the Skagit River project as well, and of course our tribal pool managers who have been helping out with a lot of these monitoring efforts uh, that you're going to be, I'll be talking about tonight. So, just wanted to make sure I acknowledge all of my team. This is not just me. We have a really important team effort here, so I just want to make sure that I'm giving a shout out to all those guys. So with that, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. So what exactly is hydroacoustics? What do we mean when we say that? Well, hydroacoustics simply is hydro being water and acoustics being sound. So it's all this is is just using sound to explore the environment. And there's two different types of hydroacoustics that are kind of used in this capacity. Uh, we have passive acoustics and we have active acoustics. Passive acoustics is exactly what it sounds like. You're just kind of passively listening to the environment and these are things like the hydrophones that you see at Lime Kiln that listen to whales. Uh, there's a hydrophone that's been active up in Edmonds recently too for the same reason, to listen for whales. Uh, they pick up just environmental noise and you can use that to interpret what's happening in the environment. The other one is active acoustics, which is we are actively sending sound out into the water. This might be a little bit more familiar for this group because this includes a lot of things that you might be familiar with. These are our single beam echo sounders, our split beam echo sounders, and our multi beam. Your single beam is like your fish finder that's on your boat. Uh, split beam are more of like a scientific type echo sounder, which I will talk about more. And then finally, the multi beam, which is pretty much the system that we're using on the Skagit River. I will go into more detail on all of this in just a minute, but I just wanted to kind of lay out like what all this is that I'll be talking about. So again, I just use a lot of words, so I want to make sure that I'm explaining all of them properly in case, again, I don't know what everybody's familiarity is. So um, when I talk about an echo sounder, this is simply the instrument that we're using to make sound to send out into the water. This is the brains of the operation. It is doing all the work. It is interpreting all the things that we're getting back, and it's telling us what's happening out there. A transducer is basically just a device that uh, converts any kind of energy. So if anybody who does any engineering, uh, particularly electrical engineering, uh, this is a very familiar concept. Um, in this case, in the case of a sonar system, it's turning electricity into sound. So that's what's being transduced here in terms of the energy. Uh, the beam is the spread of sound that's emitted from the transducer. And so I'll talk about this later on. So the beam angle is basically the, the swath of sound that's being sent out into the water. So all echo sounders, all transducers have a different beam angle, and that's important because it's basically telling you how much of the water column we're sampling. Uh, the ping is one pulse of sound. So 
every time the transducer goes off, every time the echo sounder makes a noise, that's one ping. The pulse rate is the number of pings that are happening per unit of time, typically per second. So every second, how many pings are going out? And it's typically a lot, and I'll show that in a few minutes. Uh, the target is any object in the water column that reflects down back. So this could be a fish, it could be a school of plankton, it could be some kelp on the bottom, it could be a rock, it could be a sunken ship. Um, I once swam in front of our transducers as they were pinging, and so I was the target, and I do not recommend it. It was not fun. Uh, the target strength is the uh, basically an acoustic proxy, the size. The larger something is typically, the more sound it can reflect back. So the stronger the target strength will be. Um, and then finally, all of this is measured using decibels. And so this is a term that if you hear a lot, you, know, you go to if you either Sounders game or a, a Seahawks game, and it's like, oh, this, the you know the noise there was this many decibels. Uh, basically, all this is is a ratio of the sound emitted to the sound return. So it's what that change in sound is, and it gives us a, an idea of what the energy is that's reflected back. So. Um, so as I go through this, I will use these terms. I just wanted to make sure that you guys all have the background in case this is, these are terms that are unfamiliar in this context. So again, we're going into some more of the background here. As I said, uh, you know, we have this active hydroacoustic system, so we're sending out this pulse of sound. Here in this little graphic here, we have, we're sending out a pulse. It's hitting one target, which is this fish, and then it's hitting a second target, which is the bottom here. Um, for a single or a split beam system, um, as I was kind of talking about before, it sends, it's one echo sounder sending a pulse from one transducer, and so that's however many times it's doing that per second. Uh, for a multi-beam system, it's multiple transducers that are all talking at the same time, and I'll show you what that looks like in a few minutes. And so those are all interpreted simultaneously. So when we're collecting this data now, so we're talking about here a single or a split beam system, the pulse rate is generally three to five pings per second. So every second you're getting about four data points. So in the kind of the time I've been talking now, we're thinking about it, I've been talking for maybe about five minutes. That's 240 samples per minute times five minutes is 1,200 samples. So in the time I've been talking, we would have collected 1,200 data points had I been do, running a survey as I was talking. So that just kind of gives you an, an idea of the sheer amount of data we can collect using these systems. Um, for a multi-beam system, at the, the one that we use is at a high, uh, at the high frequency is 15 frames per second, so it's an even higher pulse rate than what we're talking about here. And in terms of what this actually looks like, this is one pulse here. So you can just see the sheer amount of information that's collected in one pulse, and again, we're doing four of those per second times every minute of every hour of every day, potentially. So this is what it looks like. And here we have this, the, the pulse going down the water, so we have depth here on the, the y-axis, and on the x-axis here, it, this is our dB, so this is the, the difference, the decibels. So how much energy is being reflected back? We can see that the strongest reflection here is going to be the seafloor. And then anything that's here that's kind of above this kind of average that you can see is going to be targets. So any of these high points here are targets that were in the water column. So in this case, it was fish that we were sampling. So this is an actual sample from one of our surveys. So again, one of these four times a second for every minute that you're sampling out there. So you get an idea of just how much data that this is. So using this, again, we can collect this a massive amount of data over both large spatial and temporal scales. So I was just talking, I'll, I'll, I'll get to questions in a, in a few minutes. So I was just talking about the temporal scale and how much data we can collect over time. Well, we can also translate this to collecting data over space. So this is actual data collected from uh, the Alaska Fishery Science Center's uh, acoustic trawl survey that is done every year. So uh, the Gulf of Alaska is surveyed every other year, and then on alternate years it's in the Bering Sea. And so you can see you can sample all the way out from the, the Aleutian Islands all the way up uh, to the Akatat Bay is kind of the extent of that survey. Uh, this is a survey I have worked on before. This is actually krill data. So this is every point where they found krill along the transect, this transect line. So this is a massive amount of space that you can survey uh, over an extensive amount of time and just imagine how much data is collected in, over the entire Alaskan coast over that time. So just kind of setting up for just how much data we're actually collecting doing these things. So um, just to kind of get more into this, so these systems are, are not, this technology is not new. This has been around for a while. There's lots of areas where this is being used. Um, and it, it is widely used in, in different types of fisheries assessments. But it's, we're kind of new, these are newer projects to our area, so these are newly implemented projects by the state 
that we are doing to monitor fisheries here in our home waters. So there's places that are it's been used widely, including like what I just showed, which is up in Alaska for Alaskan pollock, uh, in Norway for Norwegian herring, in Antarctica for krill, which is where a lot of this techn technology was actually developed, um, on the west coast for whiting. And then there are a bunch of other projects that are using this specifically to look at salmonids, um, including up in Alaska where there's numerous systems that have systems like this set up, um, and in Canada on the Fraser system. And the Fraser system is important to folks in this room because uh, you know Fraser, Fraser stocks can impact our fisheries as well. Um, and they are both using uh, using the Ares acoustic cameras pretty extensively in those areas. So with that background, now I'm going to kind of move into some of our more specific projects. So the first one I wanted to talk about again is this, the Skagit uh, Hydroacoustic Monitoring Project. So the Skagit, for anybody who, is anybody, does anybody here fish the Skagit River or Baker Lake? All right, so we got a couple people that might find this really interesting then. So uh, the Skagit, you know, so as some of you probably know or are very familiar with, this is a really popular summer fishery. Uh, and understanding the run timing is pretty critical to doing in-season management effectively. Uh, In-season abundance is determined from the Baker Lake uh, upriver up fish trap, um, from the trap count. But we implement this project because we're hoping that hydroacoustics down in the river will be able to give us an earlier indication of what that stock size is going to be uh, so that we can do more effective in-season management and have an earlier idea of what that looks like as opposed to the Baker Lake trap. So uh, in the this, Skagit this River, we're looking particularly at stock size. So, and the ideas are to provide an in-season abundance estimation of salmon stocks, again, particularly sockeye, uh, returning to the Skagit River system. The first phase of this project has been to determine the feasibility of using acoustics in the system to monitor uh, adult sockeye returning to the Skagit River. And then the second phase is to validate those counts um, and develop these tools for in-season management so that we can use this as part of our in-season management tool. So again, I talked about different types of technology that we're using here. The one that we're using for this project is the ARIS 1200. It is one of the multi-beam sonars that I just mentioned. Um, and it's known as an acoustic camera. And that's because you, it gives you video-like quality, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, so you actually can, like, you, you can see all these different interactions. So I was saying before that we have a transducer that's sending out one ping however many times a second. This one has 48 beams. So this thing right here is about the size of an old camcorder. So it's about the size of the bag I wrote in that has a projector in it. That's about the size of these cameras. And within this, this plate here that you can see are 48 individual transducers. And they're all working together. And that's why you get this high resolution of this data. Um, it can operate at two different frequencies. Um, we are operating ours at high frequency because we're getting better uh, kind of movement information on that, which is critical to what we're trying to do. Um, and at that high frequency, the detection range is about 35 meters across the river. The benefit of these is that uh, they're not limited at all by water, well, water clarity. So again, if it's called an acoustic camera because we get this video-like image, but it's using sound, I actually had these on an ROV with a, an actual video camera on top of it, and the video, it was so murky that you could not, the visibility was zero. You could not see anything at all, but in the, the acoustic camera, you can see perfectly fish interacting with the bottom. It's not hampered at all by any kind of water quality. So as the river gets murky, if you get these pressure events, doesn't matter, you still get awesome data quality. Uh, so that's really important in river systems where you know things can change really rapidly. You can also provide information on behavior because you can see what the fish are actually doing. You can see predation events. We've seen, you know, fish moving up the river and other fish coming in and eating them. You can see fish interacting with the habitat. You can see fish moving in around like mangrove roots and things like that. So there's some really cool stuff that is, these have been used for to, to kind of view these interactions. Uh, you can get really great length data because these are all stereo systems. You can actually measure the exact lengths of the fish that are moving through as they're moving up the system, uh, which is again really important for what I'm going to get into in a little bit. Um, and then you can also determine swimming speeds. You can count tail beats. You can see how fast the fish are moving through the system. And these are all tools that can be used to identify what's in the camera. The limitation is obviously species identification. That's the big holdup with all hydroacoustic systems is that you really need some way to ground with what you're seeing to make sure that uh, you, what you think you're seeing is what you're actually seeing. We can get pretty close with a lot of the different ways that we have to kind of assess this data. But really, we do need something that's going to prove that what we think we're seeing is actually what we're seeing. 